This is lecture five on membrane transport mechanisms. In the previous lecture, we covered diffusion in osmosis across an open system or a semi-permeable membrane. However, if the molecule is not permeable to the membrane, there has to be a transport protein that permits passage. This would be a general doorway or opening in the cell that would allow things to move in. Keep in mind, however, that in many cases, the actual movement of the molecule is still governed by the rules of diffusion. We're going to examine two major classes of proteins that help move large and or lipophobic molecules across the cell. We'll be looking at, on this case, channel proteins and carrier proteins. Now, channel proteins are membrane-spanning proteins that create a water-filled pore. And we can see that here. They come in two types, gated or open channels. A gated channel is going to respond to specific signals in order to open up, whereas an open channel is usually always open. Carrier proteins here on the right never form an open channel between the two sides of the membrane. They can be integral or peripheral, and they change shape in order to move molecules across a given membrane. They come in three major types, a uniporter, a symporter, or an antiporter. When looking at channel proteins, here we can see an example of a channel protein that is a membrane-spanning or integral protein to create a water-filled pore. This allows for the movement of substance through the channel by simple diffusion, so the movement of high to low concentration, and is usually limited to smaller molecules, things like water or selected ions. An example of a channel protein in the body is an aquaporon. These are special channels that are found in the kidneys that allow for the movement of water across the membrane to help prevent dehydration. Now, how do channel proteins regulate what crosses them? There are two ways in which this happens. The first is selectivity. Selectivity is going to be the restriction of movement of molecules based on size, or charge, etc. So being a selective channel. The second is gating. As discussed earlier, the channel proteins are going to allow it to be gated or open. If they are gated, the channel can actually control what goes through them in either a chemical, electrical, or mechanical gating mechanism. Carrier proteins work a little bit differently. They work as far as opening passage to one side and having a molecule come in to bind. This is called carrier-mediated transport. Now, there are several types of carrier-mediated transport, but all of them involve a lot of the same capacity of a molecule coming in, binding to the actual receptor site to allow the gate to open to the other side, much like how the Panama Canal works to where a boat enters in from the Pacific Ocean into the central area through the gate. And the gate closes on the Pacific Ocean side while the boat waits, and then the Atlantic Ocean gate opens and it passes through. This is the same way that it works inside of a cell. Now, there are three types of carrier proteins. Here are the three types of carrier proteins. A uniporter, a symporter, and an antiporter. Uniporters move one molecule one direction. Symporters move two molecules in one direction. And an antiporter moves two molecules in opposite directions. The symporter and antiporter are known as co-transporters because they transport two molecules. Looking at examples of each one of the types of carrier proteins, we'll start with the uniporter. Uniporters, again, are carrier proteins that only permit the movement of one kind of specific molecule. The example we have here is a GLUT1. GLUT1 is a specialized uniporter that only moves glucose. Here, we can see the uniporter is allowing glucose molecules to move from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid. This is guided through the process of facilitated diffusion, going from a high concentration of glucose on the outside to a lower concentration of glucose on the inside. Looking at our two types of co-transporters, we have a symporter and an antiporter. The symporter here is the SGLT1, or the sodium-linked glucose transporter one. A symporter is a co-transporter that carries two molecules at the same time in the same direction. The SGLT1 shown here is an intestinal symporter that moves both glucose and sodium into the cells from the intestinal lumen. The antiporter that we show here 
is the sodium calcium exchanger or NCX. It's found in the heart and it moves calcium out of the cell in exchange for sodium into the cell. Always remember that antiporters move two molecules as well, but they will move in opposite directions. So we've talked about some of the different classifications of carrier proteins, but carrier proteins have another way of organizing them. That is based upon their source of transport energy. Carrier proteins can be subdivided into two categories based on where they get energy for transport. Regardless of the energy source, they can also be uniporters, symporters, or antiporters. The first source of energy is going to be a passive carrier-mediated transport known as facilitated diffusion. Key word there being passive. Passive means that it requires no ATP, so no energy is required to perform any of the actions or movement. It is a passive transport that uses diffusion to move from high concentration to low concentration. In this case, the carrier binds to the molecule, then changes the shape to move the molecule across the membrane, and the rate of transport is only limited by the number of available carrier proteins. Here, once all the carrier proteins are saturated, no increase in the rate of transport is seen. An example that we use for carrier mediated transport, passive carrier mediated transport or facilitated diffusion is the GLUT1. GLUT1 is going to be an example of this type of mediated transport. It's going to be a passive form of transport that is simply transporting glucose from high concentration on the outside to low concentration on the inside. The next types of transport are active transport. The key word is active. Active means that it requires ATP or energy for the process. And this is going to generally be used for any sort of transportation of any molecule that is going against a concentration gradient. It's going to require energy. This type of transport is what is generally responsible for the existence of concentration gradients that can be used by other processes for potential energy. There are two types of active transport that are defined by where they get the energy needed for the transport. The first is primary active transport. This is going to use ATP directly. It uses the energy from ATP to pump molecules or ions across the membrane and against their concentration gradient. They're often called ATP aces, as a portion of the transport protein is also an enzyme that breaks down ATP to ADP. So primary active transport always moves things independent of the concentration gradient. We have some great examples here in the sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium pumps that exist in the body. And these are all designed to maintain the individual gradients of these ions and a lot of membrane potential. And then of course we have one of the best examples of this is the sodium potassium ATPase. It exchanges three intracellular sodium ions for two extracellular potassium ions. This uses up to 40% of ATP in a resting cell. So here's an example of the sodium potassium exchange pump primarily used in neurological function. We're moving potassium ions in and our sodium ions out. In order to activate this pump, we need ATP because both ions are going against the concentration gradient. The next type of active transport that we'll be discussing is secondary active transport. Secondary active transport also uses energy to move a molecule against its chemical gradient, but the energy comes from the movement of a molecule that is going with it down its own concentration gradient. So one is going against the gradient, the other is going with the gradient. That means that we can use this molecule that's going with the gradient to move the other molecule because there is stored and potential energy in a concentration gradient. Examples we have are the sodium and glucose transporter, SGLT1. Sodium and glucose bind together to a carrier protein. The sodium flows down its normal concentration gradient and pulls glucose with it. The cell uses ATP to pump sodium back out of the cell. So ATP is used after the fact to maintain balance. So secondary active transport we can see is the glucose molecule coming in going from a generally low concentration on the outside to a higher concentration inside, whereas sodium is naturally going down its concentration gradient from high to low. So bringing along glucose molecules with it. Once inside the cell, the glucose will stay, whereas sodium gets pumped back out 
using ATP. In this case, the sodium calcium exchanger is a secondary active transport mechanism as well. These cells are not always just used independently. Oftentimes they are linked together. In this case, we can see that SGLT1 is going to be bringing sodium and glucose in. Glucose is used in the cell and brought all the way through glute receptors, which would be a sample of a uniporter. And then we have, of course, our sodium potassium antiporter pumps. So oftentimes, many of these types of uh, transport mechanisms are going to be used on the same cell and used to work together in many fashions. So we've been talking about membrane transport using different sorts of carrier proteins or channel proteins, so proteins embedded in the membrane. But in some cases, materials are a little bit too large to fit through those protein channels. So we need another way to move them. And we call this type of transport bulk transport, moving larger items. We have two major types of transportation that we're going to be looking at, excitosis and endocytosis. Endocytosis is bringing things into the cell. Exocytosis is pushing things out of the cell. So exocytosis, you can see here, is the very last step as far as letting things go from the cell. You can think of the cell kind of uh, defecating or vomiting to spit that material out of the cell. And that's exocytosis. Endocytosis has three different mechanisms by which it works. The first is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. In receptor-mediated endocytosis, we have a different, this material bind to the surface of the cell at different receptor sites. That will cause the cell to actually pinch off a pocket of, these, of this compound and form what we call a vesicle, a coated membrane of this general material. It will bring it inside of the cell and then bind it to a lysosome. Now, if we remember, lysosomes contain digestive enzymes to process different compounds. Once inside, it will digest that, whatever that compound is, and it will release different compounds into the cell and maybe have any kind of waste product that's left over. That waste product will then reattach to the cell surface membrane and through exocytosis, release it out. The other two mechanisms of which are forms of endocytosis are phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Now they work very much the same way, but pinocytosis is a form of cell drinking. Here, we're actually consuming an acquiesce molecule. It's a formation of endosomes within the extracellular fluid that brings in or kind of drinks a general liquid into the cell. The way I always remember this is pinot like a wine, it's cell drinking. The other type of endocytosis is called phagocytosis. This is going to be cell eating. In this case, we actually are going to extend portions of the membrane around a given uh, molecule, in this case the bacterium that's coming in, and it's going to encapsulate it in that vesicle, bring it in, break it down with the lysosome, and then eliminate through exocytosis whatever compound is left over. Some great examples of different organisms that perform phagocytosis are going to be your different uh, macrophages or neutrophils. A lot of your white blood cells perform these types of actions. So this is going to make up the finish of membrane transport.